Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin today's seminar by acknowledging that this meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Bindal and Gurukaba peoples, and join me in paying respect to elders, both past and present. Our expectation is that interactions during this seminar are constructive and that all attendees behave with respect and consideration for others. Uh, thank you all again for to everyone for joining us today. Um, it's a privilege to introduce today's speaker. Our speaker today is uh, K.M. Reyes. She's a political scientist, uh, conservation lobbyist, community organizer, and national geographic explorer based on the beautiful island of Palawan in the Philippines. She's the program director and co-founder of the Center for Sustainability, PH, a women and youth-led environmental, non-government, non-profit organization. Their work was instrumental in the declaration of Cleopatra's Needle Critical Habitat in 2017, a major watershed habitat for numerous endemic flora and fauna. Her organization was also awarded as one of the 10 accomplished youth organizations in the Philippines in 2019. Um, and she's currently stuck in Europe, but she has uh, kindly agreed to um, wake up this early. And today, uh, KM will talk about her experiences in rainforest conservation, in challenging political environments, and also the implications of this for indigenous peoples. And with that, um, join me in welcoming KM. I can't. I can't see anyone, so I don't, I don't know. But I'm assuming that everybody's there and listening. Um, so should I just go ahead and start? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Well, um, hi, everybody. Greetings from cold Germany at five in the morning. Um, I am KM Reyes. And uh, as you can see, I'm the co-founder of the Center for Sustainability PH. Um, so I just wanted to spend today to talk a little bit about our experiences uh, at CS as frontline conservationists, and maybe also share a little bit about our experiences, um, especially with regards to research, because as far as I understand, this is the audience that um, we're with today. So just a little bit of background about where I'm from or where I'm based. Obviously, you can probably hear I have a very strong Australian accent. So I'm Australian Filipino. And the other half of me is based in a very um, special place called the Philippines, which is one of 17 mega diverse countries of the world. And just in ASEAN or in Southeast Asia, it's uh, one of three of the mega diverse countries of Southeast Asia. Um, the Philippines is extremely special, obviously I'm very biased, but because it harbors the highest concentration of vertebrate diversity on the earth. Um, and considering how small it is, 300 um, square, 300,000 square kilometers, it's, you know, it's a pretty special place. So just highlighting a few of the very special uh, wildlife that we have uh, in the Philippines. So for example, we have the Palawan monitor lizard that reaches up to seven feet. Um, we have the Philippine tar seer, which is one of our very charismatic species from central Philippines. If any of you have had the good fortune of coming um, to like central Philippines in the Visayas around uh, Bohol, it's very, very well known for its tourism around the Philippine tar seer. Uh, we also have um, the Palawan horn frog, which is uh, just here in Palawan, as you can tell by the name. We have many endemic species, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, the Philippines is also very special because of the amphibian species that are found in the Philippines. So far, 85% uh, of them are endemic and yet you know a lot of the Philippines still remains unstudied so who knows um we also have the Philippine pangolin which is obviously the number one poached animal globally and has gotten a lot more of a spotlight than in the past and we find that also in the areas that we protect in Palawan it's only found uh, in the province of Palawan 
Asian small clawed otter, which is also another one that's very important for um, for the wildlife trade. So at CS, we've spent a lot of time at CITES trying to up its um, recognition there. And then the Philippine eagle, which is obviously our national bird, very, very charismatic species and a lot of you know, very important conservation programs have been designed around this. Unfortunately, though, um, you probably might be aware of some of the dire statistics that we have uh, across the planet and in Southeast Asia, and certainly the Philippines is no exception. So the Philippines was 95% covered in pristine rainforest, 90 to 95%, and now only 3% of these pristine or primary rainforests are left in the Philippines. And obviously the Philippines is also key as being part of the coral triangle, the Pacific Triangle. So uh, only 4% of Philippine coral reefs remain in excellent condition. Um, so as a result of that, we are a small group of um, women and youth from the island of Palawan. Um, and just to point out my colleagues here, so this is my co-founder Jessa and Solomon. We co-founded the Center for Sustainability PH back in 2016. We also have Robert, Aubrey and Otaniel. Um, a few things to highlight besides myself, um, everybody here is either Indigenous or from a local community of Palawan. Um, and Otaniel was just 16 years old when we first started this project, which became an organization uh, later on. So it just goes to show that at any age, uh, change can happen. And um, it really is, you know, the youth that's kind of trying to lead the vanguard now, uh, certainly in Palawan, which is known as the Philippines' last ecological frontier. Now, we decided to bring together this organization because uh, we're women because we're youth, we don't have a strong voice, we're up against uh, age, prejudice and patriarchy in the Philippines and so organizing ourselves into a platform was much more effective. And also my colleagues who grew up in Palawan um, who've spent you know, their whole lives have seen a total transformation of the island because of development tourism. And that was the other reason why we decided that it was important to establish this organization. So the Center for Sustainability PH is a women-led youth environmental nonprofit organization from Palawan, the Philippines. And our mission number one, if there's anything that we want you to take away from today about our organization, it's that we can serve land. And our mission is to protect the Philippines' last remaining 3% of pristine rainforests through the establishment of protected areas. Um, and so I just want to give a little snapshot here of what Palawan looks like. So it really is kind of paradise on earth. We have been voted the number one uh, best island in the world several times by uh, very prestigious magazines and different um, voting mechanisms online. Um, and that's been both a, a bane and a, and a beauty. Uh, we've gotten a lot of recognition for that a lot of tourism, um, but obviously it's trying to keep it sustainable. It's been kind of the balancing act. And most importantly about the Center for Sustainability PH, our work comes from communities, is for communities and goes to communities. Um, and this is kind of the compass that controls and dictates and guides all of our work. So I just want to kind of yeah highlight that as we go into this presentation and I talk more about even some of the research challenges that you'll that we'll talk about that we face on the ground and it's really this part about communities that I think there's a lot of consensus about it especially at the international level now um, but we're not really seeing it on the front lines and that's you know really what needs to change so a little bit about our work um, so the mother of um, the apple of my eye is Cleopatra's Needle. It's an area in central Palawan, just in our backyard, uh, in where we live in Puerto Princesa City. It's an area that is uh, here, the critical habitat is 41,000 hectares, um, but it's actually a much bigger area than that. This is just the area that we were trying to protect and it's 1600 meters above sea level. What's really special about Palawan is that um, basically all of the, it's not developed yet so you can't get up to the mountain tops without 
uh, actually hiking up there. We don't have roads yet, um, yet being the key word. Hopefully we can make sure that that stays that way. Um, but here, this is the peak Cleopatra's Needle, which is how it got its name. Um, it was named after, uh, it's named by Americans that came into uh, Palawan and basically mapped the entire area. But I do want to highlight the indigenous name, which is Puyos Nibayi. Puyos is like when you have a tight bun at the top of your head in uh, Filipino. And Bayi is the name of kind of a common woman known as the kind of foremother of the Batak people, which is um, the community that uh, has inhabited this area since time immemorial. Now, this area, um, which is super important to our organization, is important because it's firstly a really big area that we were able to secure the protection of. It's nearly two thirds the size of Townsville, um, just to put it into local perspective. So if you can imagine the six of us hiking and um, doing research and community organizing and lobbying. It was all around um, this area. Um, There's a lot of yeah, hiking and getting lost involved at the beginning. Um, the area is really, really important because it's home to 61 Palawan endemic species and 31 IUCN globally threatened species. And I will just highlight that those numbers come from just rapid biodiversity assessments. We haven't done major long-term research stations um, as yet. And so, this is very kind of summary discoveries um, and knowledge that we've been able to collect in the area. And most importantly, it's the ancestral domain of the disappearing Batak tribe. The Batak tribe is only 200 members left. They're a peace loving community that have been slowly pushed up um, the forests into the upland areas because of development and tourism and migration um, and this project really came from them. So two of the members, my co-founder Solomon and our youngest member, Otoniel, uh, grew up with, with the Batak communities, um, part of the same. You know, there's a lot of communities that live side by side together. Um, and Solomon is from the Puyunan tribe, which is another tribe in Palawan. Uh, and this project really came about because you know, through our relationships with the Batak tribe and formal relationships, they needed, basically, um, they asked for support in terms of getting the area recognized in some capacity. Ideally, the area is recognized as an ancestral domain, first and foremost, but it's a very, very long, costly process um, that we didn't have the resources at the time to gather. Uh, and also, it takes many, many years. And what we wanted to do was create a stopgap um, to give them the space later on to be able to protect the area um, with that ancestral protection. So the critical habitat was um, kind of, it's under the Wildlife Act and it's a law that uh, we found was kind of somewhere in between getting national recognition because it's a national law um, and still kind of being able to do it quickly because the development in Palawan is happening very quickly. Um, oops, and so I wanted to talk a little bit now about um, how it comes to be this particular area. A lot of people ask, how does it happen? Um, because obviously it does take quite a bit of time to get, you know, a huge sway the forest kind of legally recognized as a particular area. And so to break it down, it's basically three steps, and I'm going to take you through it right now. So community organizing is the very first step, and we started this back in 2014, so even before we were a formal organization. Um, and I just want to highlight my colleague Jessa here, my co-founder, who was very, very young when we first started this project, and we were working with community leaders um, here, uh, um, my, Chieftain Madamai, who is one of the leaders that we work with in one of the key Batak communities, who's much, much older than us. And this is basically taking time drinking coffee. This is what we say, we've become coffee expert coffee drinkers at this time. And it's mobilizing the communities, but 
spending time to really listen and understand on the ground what needs to happen. Um, and community organizing takes many forms. So it's not just speaking with our, you know, heads of community, our leaders, um, but also hiking to get up there. So I've drowned this bike many a time trying to get out to our communities. Uh, it's 10 river crossings minimum to get out there in the dry season. And that becomes even more in the wet season. Um, and it's a bit of a, it's about 70 kilometers away from our office. And uh, we work with all groups within the community. So women, this is a sole female tribal counselor of um, one of the Batak communities that we work with. Uh, we also worked with youth and youth education, trying to get everybody passionate about how important this area is. And we're also doing a lot of meetings at night, which is actually when the Indigenous Batak communities are have more time um, to really think about these big projects that you know have great impacts on on their children and themselves as a community um, and you can see here my colleague Jessa kind of in her pajamas ready to go to bed straight after the meeting um, another big part of getting designation is trying to find other ways other inroads that we can work with the community so it's not just about this big legal um, process but also seeing our efforts on the ground um, in terms of conservation on a day-to-day -day level and seeing how they can kind of connect with, um, with us. And so we can connect with them. So one of the projects that we did um, was actually working with um, the communities on reforestation. And this was something that they highlighted was really important to them. Uh, just to give a bit of context, we have the Almasiga tree so it's a very big tree, as you can see, a hardwood species that reaches up to 60 to 70 meters. And it produces a very high value resin um, called bug thick or manila copal in English. And as you can see here in this photograph, it's basically tapped like resin, uh, like a rubber is. So they cut, um, they cut into the tree uh, before the cambium layer, and then they collect this um, resin. And this project, well, this resource is really important because it's sold on the highway. They collect it, they come down from the forest and then they, um, they sell it on the highway and it's one of their only sources of cash income. Um, but the species is threatened because we have a lot of outsiders now coming in an influx of outsiders that are also tapping it. And so, um, this is one of the key things that they said, you know, if we're going to work together, one of the things that we really um, could work on is trying to figure out a solution for Almasiga. And so uh, together with the Indigenous communities, uh, we were able to develop the propagation technology of the Almasiga tree. Um, and this is actually the cones that it produces that later on opens and produces these seeds. Um, and these cones are humongous. They are... Uh, end up weighing about like 600 grams um so they're they're quite heavy and we actually have to climb up all the way up to the top to collect them so you can see here see uh one of our lito who's one of our um colleagues at um in one of the communities climbing all the way to the top to um to collect the seedlings and this is our colleague solomon our co-founder who's who's teaching rope climbing, um, safety rope climbing. But what's quite funny about that is, and this is something that I'll talk about a little bit later on, but you have local knowledge. They actually um, prefer using rattan um, to climb the trees. And we kind of reached the compromise that, you know, our donors want to make sure that we're using safety equipment. And so we use the combination of tree climbing with, you know, kind of these safety ropes and then also using um, rattan, which they much prefer to climb with climbing vines. They just feel more comfortable with that. Um, and so, yeah, one of the big achievements uh, that we reached with our communities during this community organizing and building trust process was being able to reforest the area with 15,000 seedlings of Almasiga. Um, so after we kind of, you know, get their consent and they come on board, um, which I summarized very quickly, it was a lot of toing and froing and yes and no, and they finally agreed um, as a full community because everything is reached on consensus. The next part is doing research, so getting that um, 
proof that we can lobby to sign to sign to politicians that the area needs to be protected and so uh, this is what a typical research expedition looks like so hiking up to base camp you'll see the bags um, that our indigenous communities use which is also made of rattan there's a lot of uh, river crossings again to get up there um, so we do it, it's very basic. We basically sleep in tents and or hammocks that you can see here. Um, and we do, you know, it's rapid biodiversity assessments. So we cover all the major taxa, birds, um, insects, herpetofauna, and then mammals also. Um, and I just want to highlight as we go through these slides um, that all of the models in this are actually our indigenous communities this is part of a bigger project that i'll talk about a little bit later where it was actually the indigenous communities that were trained to do all of the research themselves um so yeah once we have all of that proof the next part is the lobbying which is uh always the interesting part uh, jessa and i are the two principal lobbyists uh, in the organization. I will highlight though that because we're such a small group that we're doing lobbying at every level. So from the grassroots level with our you know, indigenous leaders and our uh, local village leaders uh, all the way to the national level. Um, but Jessa was really the first one to kind of spearhead that, that lobbying at the community level and kind of opening up those relationships. It's very challenging because it often looks like this is real, a real power imbalance. Um, this is actually one of our uh, city environment officer, um, but just in terms of, yeah, what it looks like, it's two young women uh, often um, lobbying to decision makers that are much older than us and obviously cognizant of the gender imbalance uh, often to to men. Um, so that was also quite challenging. And there's a lot of door knocking and a lot of persistence um, with that. But finally, after four years of work in 2017, we got our sweet law uh, made official and the national government declared it as a critical habitat, which was very, very exciting. Um, and we never quite knew if it was going to happen or if it wasn't going to happen. So, you know, after all of that lobbying and um, gate crushing lots of public meetings, trying to get an audience with our politicians, we were finally able to secure that, um, which was so important as well for, more importantly than anything else, the communities, the Indigenous communities that we worked with, because up until then, they didn't have any kind of real proof, like a piece of paper, that this area belonged to them and that um, they had ancestral precedence over the area, um, because the Wildlife Act uh, respects the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of the Philippines. So this is probably the most important part of this piece of paper, being able to see that the Indigenous communities could you know, feel empowered with this with this piece of paper. Um, I'm not going to go through this very quickly, but this is just a very quick snapshot of some of the very important things that we were able to achieve um, with this project. We did a lot of activities, not just, you know, the community organizing scientific research and political lobbying. Um, we also did environmental outreach to 724 students. We trained 39 community Indigenous members as uh, rangers. Um, we also worked in sustainable tourism training with the Batak members, and um, none of this could have happened, obviously, without so much time given by our volunteers. And this is just some of the very many stakeholders that we worked with. But as you can see, we worked with three upland indigenous communities, seven lowland or coastal communities, so that's 11 communities in total that we were liaising with, as well as city government, national government, uh, donors universities, uh, museums. It was, you know, it was really a group effort to, to get this over the line. Um, this is just some of the partners that we worked with. And finally, in 2019, we were recognized as one of the 10 accomplished youth organizations of the Philippines, which was really exciting because uh, in the Philippines, um, in Palawan, you know, we're very remote, we're very far flung from the rest of 
the Philippines, we're actually closer to Borneo than we are to main, you know, quote unquote mainland Philippines. So we often work in isolation. And um, so having this recognition um, at the national level was really exciting to kind of feel like, oh, okay, we're part of a bigger conversation that's happening in the country and maybe feel a little bit less isolated. Um, but Cleopatra's needle isn't enough. Um, we actually have to protect more. And so at the Center for Sustainability PH, we're working on a new area called Kensad uh, in Southern Palawan. So you'll see here that we had a big lesson learned, which was that we wanted to recognize indigenous names um, in uh, the work that we do, especially in the naming of the areas. And Kunsad is a Tagbanwa word, which basically means where the waters fall. And it's very important um, because this area is just boasts a really incredible uh, riverine system. And so at the very top, um, it's about 1200 meters above sea level. Um, at the very peak, there's actually these spectacular waterfalls. And that's just started, the project started last year, obviously with the pandemic, it's been very hard to get out there, um, but we're slowly rebooting and it will be that same kind of process as what we did at Cleopatra's Needle. So, you know, mobilizing communities, followed by scientific research, um, political lobbying, um, as well as that Al Masiga project, that reforestation project um, to you know, build trust with the communities. Here, it's not so much the Batak tribe, but actually the Thagbanwa tribe. Uh, one of our members, Robert, who I highlighted before, is from that same community. Um, and this area is quite challenging also because we're dealing with uh, mining interests in the area. So it's a whole other ball game and, you know, just watch out for updates because there's yes a lot of work to do with that um but eventually our mission is to protect palawan's remaining key biodiversity areas um, as you can see here we protected a mere 41,000, so we've got another 340,000 to go so this is the area here cleopatra's needle and now we're tackling this area here in southern palawan so we have our work cut out for us um, as you may or may not be aware, the Philippines is an extremely dangerous country for environmental and land defenders. Um, it's the second, no, it's now the third most dangerous country globally after Colombia and Mexico, according to Global, For to Global Watch, um, and is the most dangerous country in Asia for this kind of work. So, yeah, on so many levels, we have our work cut out for us. Um, but I want to take a little jump and talk about scientific research specifically, considering our audience today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges specifically with research that we've encountered. We've been on the ground now for seven years. Um, our expertise specifically within the Center for Sustainability, PH, is really our emphasis on community work. Uh, we do have Aubrey is um, our researcher. We also have a forester on board, a marine biologist, um, and then myself, a political scientist. So it's a real mixed bag, but because we spend so much time on the ground um, with the community organizing and the political lobbying end of it, we do work a lot with scientists for, for you know, reaching those kind of scientific um, targets that we need for protection. Um, so some of the key things that have come up over the last seven years of working in this area is um, the lack of local scientific capacity. Uh, and this happens on so many levels. As an organization, we're really um, dedicated and passionate about working with Palawenos, um, specifically and empowering the local communities, local community members, local youth to be a part of the research conversation. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there's, there's a real lack of training opportunities. And then the other thing is that a lot of the time, because of what's taught in schools is mainly Western perspectives, um, there isn't a lot of space given to local science, local knowledge. Um, and it becomes this vicious circle because, you know, because we don't have training opportunities or uh, scientists that come from outside that really want to take on um, local, like local researchers under their wing. Um, it means that, you know, just we just keep getting this revolving door of, of Western perspectives coming through Palawan um, and not really kind of giving 
more recognition to local perspectives. Um, and so that goes, that feeds into our second point, which is a really big part of what we see a lot. And, you know, I think, as I said before, there's a lot more global conversation about consultation and respecting local perspectives and Indigenous rights. But I can tell you that on the ground, at the front lines, every single day, we see that there is not due consultation given to local communities. Um, free and prior informed consent is not recognized. Um, researchers will not come back to share findings with what happens. Um, you know, and a big issue also that we face is that Palawan, um, because a lot of it is unstudied, there are still significant discoveries to science that are made. Um, and with nomenclature, you know, often the naming um, still kind of still named after foreign scientists or outsiders um, to the area rather than recognizing many of the indigenous and local communities that have protected the area since time immemorial. And so, you know, we've been able to have a few um, scientific discoveries that are named directly after the local communities or local community, um, like local indigenous tribes. And it's incredible to, to come back to the communities and show that to them and, and for them to see something that um, that they see every day in the forest be recognized at an international level after them. Um, and that's just, you know, just very empowering for them and very encouraging um, for them to go, okay, this is, this is something that is really important. And our contribution at the front lines protecting this area is recognized. Um, so these are, these are some of the things that we're fighting for more and more at CS. Um, I think there is definitely a very big disconnect between local communities and science um, and scientists. And I think a big part of that obviously is the publisher parish culture um, and kind of the priorities being very, very different. Um, you know, there is this kind of issue with parachute science um, and this applies not just from international scientists, but also even from scientists from other areas outside of Palawan that come, you know, from, our metropolis in in the Philippines um, that that come in, but you know don't have the because of you know their own um, priorities can't necessarily don't necessarily have time and space to you know to engage with the local communities who eventually will be the ones that are the gateway to protecting these species. Um, and so that's been a big part of, of the challenges that we face at CS. Um, and then finally, um, we, we've also had, you know, kind of struggles with um, kind of translating science um, and the work of scientists, especially because a lot of the big part of what we do is being this kind of connector of connecting, you know, local decision makers and connecting local communities. And so trying to translate a lot of the science that has come out into layman terms has been um, quite challenging also. So um, I'm wrapping up. I know this has gone on for a little bit longer than I than I hoped. Um, so just some very quick uh, things that I wanted to share about the work. Um, so I guess to get straight to the point, what science is useful for conservationists uh, like CS that are at the front lines kind of trying to defend this area uh, in partnership with local communities. I think our research that incorporates local perspectives, if it's if I'm to boil it down to one thing, it's this. Um, it's that, again, as I said, there's a lot of rhetoric at the international level about incorporating local perspectives. We don't see it. Um, I can tell you <laughs> right now. Um, often researchers will come already with with their research questions, and there's kind of a summary consultation if you know if we're lucky um, with with the local communities and incorporating local perspectives. But it's definitely not at the level it should be. Um, and local communities are often not in the conceptualization and development of these research um, projects and yeah, that just, it just completely disconnects the local communities from the researchers. And it just means that the local communities have no idea why this is important or, you know, what it, what it, why it matters um, in the long term. And so, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I can't emphasize it enough because I just see it so much. Um, so just some, you know, quick tips. I'm sure you're already very familiar with this, but, um, how can we avoid this kind of fly in, fly out science? Um, so obviously ask questions, 
Um, and when I say ask questions, I really mean ask questions to local communities that are there. And obviously I know because of all of the time constraints and resource constraints that researchers and scientists face, um, this can be really challenging. And I think that, um, you know, all of this comes down to this kind of last point that I will come to in the end, which is that these are things that we need to call out um, within our own circles. But yeah, giving space to ask questions, um, checking contextual understanding, really making sure that at the local level, you understand the context um, and, and we understand the context as, you know, kind of the frontliners on the ground um, about why the research is important um, and why it's, you know, how we're going to be able to apply it kind of in the long term. Uh, practice cultural sensitivity, which sounds obvious enough that, again, um, you know, we see it day in, day out, but that's not, that doesn't happen. And obviously that goes back, that comes back to this thing about uh, local, um, local perspectives not being um, included. Taking part in local capacity building, this is a huge part that um, we don't see enough that researchers and, and scientists coming in and, you know, having kind of these token counterparts, but not really spending time to really build relationships with local scientists to kind of continue the work after they've learnt, um, you know, all of these skills. So that's another part that, you know, hopefully there can be more opportunities and more proactive um, scientists and researchers out there working on mentorship in these in these research areas, especially in these kind of highly biodiverse areas that often don't have a lot of um, local capacity there. And then obviously share, sharing publication, authorship, recognizing indigenous communities or local communities that are in the area. And most importantly, yeah, calling it out. I think it's super important to recognize that we all bear responsibility. Um, and, you know, in so many of the discussions that I've had with scientists, I, you know, I see that we all are facing so many challenges. Um, but yeah, finding ways to call it out and shift the needle, move the needle um, only happens when, when we raise it and we, and we call it out when we see it. Um, so I think that's the end. Oh, this is one last slide. I just wanted to highlight something that we did um, as a result of these research challenges that we came to. And these are some of the pictures that I showed earlier, which is that we started a project um, two, years ago, two years ago called Knowledge is Power to the Forest. And it's basically a citizen science project. And we're training Indigenous and community rangers to um, conduct uh, science and communication um, activities themselves, the spearhead these activities. So it's upskilling rangers to conduct biodiversity research. So that was super exciting. There's scientists from uh, Manila that flew in and did these really incredible trainings um, with the uh, with the indigenous and local community rangers. And so like that specimen preservation that you saw earlier, uh, the trapping, the data collection, all of that was actually on um, the stars were our rangers, including Mrs. Noel, uh, a Tagbanwa ranger. Um, and then very importantly, also upskilling the rangers to communicate the research results to stakeholders. Because one of the biggest things is that um, the communities are still quite fearful to reach out um, and speak up to decision makers and so this is a really big part of it about kind of showing rangers that once you have once we have the knowledge then we can share that more effectively to decision makers to kind of influence policy and different kinds of decisions and that's the end we are the center for sustainability ph so thank you for your time